This episode is brought to you by Morty, Rizova, Recon, and Patreon supporters like you. Supporting our sponsors supports our work. This year, we're hosting Recon, the reality escape convention virtually, so that we can bring our entire global community together. Our team has decided to alternate one year in person, one year virtual, and this year we are doing it online. If you're an escape room designer or owner, you must come to Recon. There is literally no better place to learn the ropes, hear from experts, and meet your fellow creators. And if you're an escape room enthusiast and you love talking about puzzles, experiences, this is definitely the place for you. There is honestly nothing more fun to me than coming together with a group of like-minded people to explore all of the topics that excite you. Recon has a variety of ticket types to meet your needs, and the basic ticket is free. No tricks. We want our global community at Recon, and we hope to see each and every one of you there August 19th and 20th, 2023. You can learn more at realityescapecon.com. Details in the show notes. Tickets are on sale now. Welcome to the Reality Escape Pod, your lifeline when you need a getaway from the real world. I'm David Spira, alongside my co-host, PG Law. Together, we're exploring immersive gaming from all angles, and we'll be joined by guests who really know their stuff. Today's guest is from Las Vegas, Nevada, by way of New York City. We're joined by comedian, magician, and immersive creator, Harrison Greenbaum. He has been everywhere. America's Got Talent, Last Comic Standing, Recon. For years, he was performing 600 shows per year. He's the creator of the immersive experience, The Scam, the Society of Conjurers and Magicians. And he currently is the star of the Cirque du Soleil show, Mad Apple, playing now at the New York, New York in Las Vegas, Nevada. Welcome, Harrison. Hello. I love it. I love one of the hosts is PG Law. I'm going to be R-rated Greenbaum. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great place to start. Um, this is a content <laughs> warning. If you are familiar with Harrison, this will come as no surprise. This is inevitably going to be an explicit show, and there's a good chance that it will be our most explicit show. I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so if that's going to be a problem you can tune in next episode and we'll be back to normal that is probably the longest resume david has ever read out as an introduction guest so congratulations on that thank you i was exhausted doing it and hearing it <laughs> I got to be honest with you, Harrison, I go out of my way to try and listen to pretty much everything that our guests have ever done, all of the interviews they've ever done before we record. And fuck you. Like, you're everywhere. <laughs> you ruined my week. <laughs> you're like, that story again? We get it. It was hard. Wow. David really took his leash off with the vulgarity. I'm so impressed. I'm so excited. This is the best part. (laughs) The hot out of the gates. Wow. Uncensored Greenbaum. Been there, done that. Uncensored Spira. This is what we're talking about. Uh, So yeah, vulgar David mode engaged. All right. Unlocked. (laughs) I don't know how many experience points it takes, but I got them. So we met years ago and we've been friends for a while. You emailed our contact page. You're a long time and avid escape room player. How did you get into the hobby? It was that or drugs. (laughs) Why not both? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, that would be a hell of a room is I've done some drug themed ones, but they never let you do the drugs. Could you imagine? Uh, I, that would be a good company. Each room is a different rhythm based on the drug. Like a meth room is really intense. An acid room would be really insane. It's just white walls. You just make your own. You just see the puzzles in your mind. Imagine your own adventure. <laughs> yeah, this is great. I get 10 percent. Uh <laughs> When you're on the road touring as a comedian, you're always kind of looking for things to do in each town. I think I had in my head when I started out as a comic, I'm going to get to go to all the best cities in the world. 
And I have gotten to go to some really nice places, but often the place that has a comedy club is a sad town that needs laughs. Uh, So you end up in weird places. (laughs) But those weird places have two things, heroin and escape rooms. And I chose the latter. They're about the same price. That's right. I don't know. I, it depends on where you are. They, it's neck and neck sometimes. Yeah. Truly, I have no idea how much heroin costs. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they charge you by 60 minute increments. So escape rooms have changed a lot over the years. And like me, you've been playing them about as long as any American has. Is there anything you especially miss or don't miss from those early years of escape rooms? I remember when Escape the Room came to New York, there was one escape room in New York uh, and it was an office themed in an office. And the uh, clue master was a lady who sat in a chair. That was Rita Orlov, probably. I'm post curious. Pro- yeah, yeah, exactly. And they were like, don't hold her hostage. You can't threaten her. She won't give you clues. Like I can imagine there were people who were like very threatening to this poor clue master. And I did that room. I was addicted. I thought it was amazing. And then I did the agency, which was their second room. And there was a second and third room and a secret passage. Talking about heroin, I've been chasing that dragon ever since. That high of opening up a refrigerator door and realizing it's a door. But they were definitely low tech. And the scale of some of these things have gotten crazier and crazier and movie sets and the technology has been exponentially better. Still the same four themes. Uh, still uh, still <laughs> zombies eyes, and uh, prisons for most of them. The stop clock. Yeah. Oh, a stop clock. That's going to be the combo. But yeah, I mean, it's been interesting to see the whole industry sort of start from nothing. I met some younger, I think it was a young comedian. He was like 20 or 21. And so we were talking about escape rooms and he's like, oh, you've been doing that since you were a kid. And I was like, no, it didn't exist when I was a child. There was no such thing as a birthday party where you did an escape room, maybe a laser tag or a roller rink. But it's really amazing that like this was something that only existed in my adulthood. I can only imagine what would have happened if these existed when I was in middle school and high school. Same. I might have had friends. (laughs) So I asked a couple of our mutual friends for suggestions, for questions for you. And one of them asked, is it difficult being an escape room player when you're late for everything? Ah, I know exactly who asked that question. I believe it's one, <laughs> Emily Gillette. <laughs> um, we're on time sometimes. Yeah, it's especially with Las Vegas. I, I drive now. For those who don't know my recent history, I was living in New York City, lived in the same apartment for 14 years, doing 600, 700 stand-up shows a year. I get a call. Uh, they say, hey, can you be in Las Vegas tomorrow? We'll fly you at 7 a.m., you're in the show at 7 p.m. It's a Cirque du Soleil show. They've never had stand-up comedy. They want to try it. Somebody is out. We need you to come in and do stand-up comedy in a Cirque du Soleil show. It's uncensored. Do whatever you want. So I'm like, great. I'm on the plane. I do the show. There's a lot of MGM people, Cirque people, people involved in the show. They're like, hey, can you stick around till Tuesday? And I'm like, yeah, I got three pair of underwear. I can make it last. <laughs> I do the show Tuesday. They go, you know what? We have shows Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. You might as well do all of the shows. So I go, all right, I might have to cancel a couple of things, but I'll, I'll try to make this work. This seems like a cool opportunity. I finish the shows on Saturday. By that point, they've sent a contract to my agent. I get on the plane to come back to New York for four more days. I don't realize that the next time I'm on the plane is to just be in Las Vegas. So I was kidnapped. I was kidnapped by a Montreal circus uh, and <laughs> ended up starring in a Cirque du Soleil show, something that was not on my comedy bingo card. But because I moved from New York to... Las Vegas, I had to buy a car and now I drive that car, which I don't know is a good thing for the other drivers on the road. (laughs) I got a Tesla so I could blame the robot. I could gauge the self-driving and go, it's not my fault, which I'm sure they want to (laughs) hear. So that's probably one of the reasons I've been late as of late uh, is I'm now driving myself to places. Well, so, you know, I have a regular escape room group and my friend Tommy usually books most of the rooms and he always sends out Google Calendar invites. And it's always this thing where he'll sometimes put the times in as 15 minutes early, but I can never tell. Is it like the time that he's put in the calendar? Is that the start time? Is Mm. that the time you are supposed to be there because you're supposed to be there 15 minutes before the start time? So this might be a good trick if you always have friends that are late to escape rooms. I like it. I think sometimes the most adrenaline I get from an escape room is getting to the escape room. (laughs) (laughs) 
that becomes the big adventure. You're running through an abandoned mall trying to find a weird storefront that is now an escape room. You finally find it with two seconds before your time starts. And you're like, we've done it. And then they're like, oh, now here's an escape room. The most of the escape rooms in L.A. are in really sketchy parts of the city. Escape room district. It should be like the escape room <laughs> is from your car and it's like escape the street. Let me into your room. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> So Harrison, I actually had heard of you even before I knew you were associated with escape rooms because I had gone to the Magic Castle. It's my first time there. There was literally only one act that I remembered from the Magic Castle. And it was this hilarious Jewish guy from New York. And I remember that you had an act with newspapers, literally the only act I remembered because it was so good. And I was so delighted to see that you were the host for one of the past recons, the virtual recon. And I was like, Harrison Greenbaum, that name sounds so familiar. And I don't remember names, but for some reason, I remembered yours. And I was like, lo and behold, it was the one act that I was like, and I messaged you. I was like, do you do an act with newspapers? You were like, yes. And I was like, I knew it. I don't know. I just thought it was very cool. But you are a comedian and a magician. Well, it was, it's a weird path. So I was a magician as, since I was a kid. So I was five years old. I was a nerdy kid magician. I went to Tannen's Magic Camp, which changed my life. I was a camper, then now a counselor. I've been there for more than 20 years. So definitely a magic nerd. And then I got to college and it was Harvard. And I only mentioned that because oh, it's the reason we got deeper into the episode before you mentioned Harvard. Yeah, yeah, 13 minutes, a new record. <laughs> <laughs> the only reason I mentioned it is because I get to Harvard and I'm trying to get into all the clubs, but everybody who's trying to join the club was the president of that club. Like everybody was the top of their club in high school. It's super competitive. I'm getting rejected left and right. The only club that will take me is the Jewish fraternity because I am a Jew and I qualify. So they're like, Shalom, brother. And uh, I get into that one. I didn't think I was even going to join a fraternity, but I was like, okay, one club is saying, yes, I'm doing it. Uh, And in that club was a member who did a stand-up comedy show at the end of the year every year. And it seen me doing funny magic and said, hey, do you want to do our stand-up show? It's spring semester. And I said, yeah, not only will I I do it, but can I do stand-up in it? (laughs) <laughs> and he unbelievably let me do stand up for the first time ever on that show. I became incredibly addicted. Um, that was right before the summer of my freshman year when I had uh, everyone was applying for really cool internships. So I felt a lot of pressure. People were, you know, like they're going to go for the Supreme Court. And I was like, I'm applying to Mad Magazine and I'm crossing my fingers because this is my dream. And I got <laughs> it. Everybody else was doing these crazy, impressive things. I was with the usual gang of idiots. I think I got the better deal. And uh, that was a comedy boot camp. So I was writing for Mad Magazine during the day, arcing, like, which is when you, I stood on a corner for two hours at a time, handing out flyers to get people to come to a show. Oh, you were one of those guys. Oh, yeah. I was on the Upper West Side, like near Cathedral Parkway, handing out flyers in the rain. And then I would come back in and be like, hey, do you remember me? I get to do five minutes at the end. So they would recognize me as the guy who handed them a flyer on the corner. And I would do five minutes of stand up or seven minutes if I was lucky. And one time before I was going on stage, a comedian saw me putting sponge balls in my back pocket because I was going to close with a magic trick. And he was like, take that out of your pocket. You'll never learn stand up if you have this sort of crutch, this sort of safety net. Uh, you have to live or die by your jokes. And so that was a really big moment for me where I realized if I want to get good at stand up, I really need to separate them. So my focus was stand up for a really long time, keeping magic as the separate endeavor, the way like a preschool teacher might hide their burlesque career, just like (laughs) pasties in a duffel bag in the closet. They don't want their students to find. So I was doing magic, but I didn't want the comedians to know I was doing it on the side. And that's how I was making a living doing bar mitzvahs and private events. Uh, So I kept them very separate for a really long time. And then it's one of those weird things. There's a quote where magic is wonderful, but magicians are what ruin it. <laughs> and there is that sense of like, I love magic so much, but I was getting really frustrated because I was working with stand-up comedians and they were all original artists. They were coming up with their own material, trying to come up with unique points of view. And magicians were just going to magic shops and buying whatever they had and just shoving it in their acts. So they, th- this all became the basis of a lecture called You Are All Terrible which is a lecture that I give to magicians. And the first slide just says, you are all terrible. I'm about to publish a book called You Are All Terrible, The Book, which I hope, fingers crossed, is going to set the record for most fucks in a magic book. There are two John JonBenet Ramsey jokes, which has got to be a record for a magic book. 
Um, there's all sorts of great things. There is a nod to escape rooms in the book as well. We could get back to that because as I was going through that lecture, I do think a lot of the advice that I give in the You Are All Terrible lecture for magicians really works for escape room creators and immersive creators. So we can definitely get into how I think those lessons from magic and comedy really lend themselves to escape rooms. Hit us with the top three. Sure. My lecture is in two parts. The first part's called Be Original, and the second part is Be Funny, so it's art and comedy. The original part, the thing that I was frustrated with magicians is that like, when you're a comedian, you come up with the idea first, and then you write the joke about it. It only stays in your act if it's funny. In magic, they tend to buy the trick first and then figure out how to jam it into their act. So they actually start with the trick and then figure out how to present it. And I always said, that's not how art works, right? If you want to paint the sky, you then go out and buy the blue or mix the blue that makes the sky. You don't start with a sky blue and you go, I guess I'm painting the sky today. So there is a sort of directionality in how you create good art. I think the same thing could be said for escape rooms, which is sometimes it, you start with the idea and the story, and then you come up with puzzles that enhance that story and idea and theme. You don't want the other way around. There's oftentimes you find a puzzle or a lock or something that is not part of that reality. And it feels like it was puzzle first, room second. Mm -hmm. And so I think that is something that could be applied. I often, when I come up with a magic trick, don't even know how I'm going to do it. I write the whole script for the trick and then figure out, okay, now I'm not a wizard. So how do I make this happen? I'm okay with somebody having created an amazing puzzle and jamming it into a room. But my thing is you have to justify it with a narrative and I'm okay with things being weird and outlandish, but don't just have it there just for the sake of having it there. But if there has been an effort made to enfold it into the narrative, I feel like I'm okay with that. Well, I think sometimes the thing that exists is the perfect thing for what you're trying to do. And that's not a problem. But I think the, the point Harrison's making is intentionality here. Yes. The idea is what's driving it, right? So it makes every other decision easy. So if you're saying, all right, we're going to do an escape room and the theme is a candy shop then everything is being directed through that lens. And if you can build a more complex story of this is the experience I want them to feel like they're having, then you can go and find puzzles and activities and things that give that person that feeling. Doing it in reverse is really hard. That's part one. In the comedy section, I always talk about the secret algorithm of comedy, which is how do stand-up comedians become funnier? Essentially, they do the joke, they run it by an audience, they see how the audience reacts to it, they edit the joke based on the reaction, they do it again, and they keep running the cycle over and over and over again until they end up with a joke that's bulletproof, that just kills every time or kills most of the time. What's interesting about magic comedy and escape rooms is they don't work without people. An escape room is not really a thing unless somebody's trying to solve it or participate in it. That's not every art form. You can sing really beautifully alone and be a good singer alone in your room. A good escape room doesn't exist without people inside of it. So it's about that algorithm of running it. One of the things I noticed from Scam is if everybody gets stuck at the same place, that's a problem with the puzzle, not a problem with the people. Yeah, absolutely. Every single time they're getting stuck on the same thing, that says something about the puzzle. And so I think that's a really important part. It's not something that can be rushed either. It's something that you just have to run over and over again and be really diligent about it. And also you sense sometimes, and I know it's harder with an escape room because once it's built, it's built and you kind of lock it in. Any joke in my act is always subject to that process. Even a joke that I've done for a really long time that's consistent. If the reaction starts to change or something is changing, I still need to be cognizant of that process. Because the joke can be the same, but over time, the audience isn't. And the way that they're reacting to it is going to be different, which is sort of like you mentioned Escape the Room at the top of this. And The Office was my first game. I think the agency was like my fifth or sixth game. And at the time, those things were blowing minds. The audience has moved past them. Those games are not good anymore. And the games haven't changed, which is the problem. That's why they're not good anymore. Right. You could have something that is great. But if you look at that feedback loop, now those audience members coming in or the, the escape room enthusiasts, you probably would notice their reaction is not the same. And so you need to change it or adjust it to get that. You should be getting wows. And there's that thing in comedy, like you're getting that involuntary reaction of laughter. In magic, there's that moment of astonishment, which is like a beautiful moment. And the reason I think we all do escape rooms is lots of reasons. But one of the main reasons is that drug, that like aha moment where everything comes together at once. And something really clever comes together, all the pieces fall into place. Those are the moments you want to be giving players. And if they're not getting those regularly, you have to adjust. So do you approach crafting your comedy shows and crafting your magic shows with the same philosophy then? Yeah, because the idea was 
when I start the lecture, I'll usually say, is magic an art? And then everybody raises their hand. And then I say, okay, define art. And most people can't even define art. They just know magic has to be art. And my (laughs) argument is, if you want magic to be considered an art, you have to approach it the way an artist does. I think really good escape room experiences can be art. The key is that originality, doing things from an original point of view. That's the kind of stuff that makes comedians work. You know what a Chris Rock joke sounds like. As soon as I say Chris Rock, you can hear him, you can picture it. And it's very different than a Bill Burr joke or a George Carlin joke. Magic, there's this like magic store mentality that is rough where magicians are just buying other people's stuff and doing it the way they saw that person do it with a trick they didn't invent with a script they didn't write based on a performance of somebody else. You're not really doing art, you're doing craft. We've had this talk a lot about purchasing rooms and Mm -hmm. we feel very much the same way. I think it's okay to purchase rooms as long as you put your own spin on things. I'm okay with that. It depends what your goal is, right? So Mm. I always say if a magician wants to be a cover band, essentially a magic cover band, that's fine, but know that you're a cover band. So it's really what you're aspiring to. I think if you want to hit the heights of the market in comedy, magic, or escape rooms, you can't just be a cover band. Yeah. You need to offer something really unique. And the rooms that are really, really great, the word gets out and people will fly from all over the world to do your room. If you're purchasing that room and just tweaking it a little bit, I don't see people flying in from Australia just to do your room. It's the same thing in magic where it's, you know, there's a pen and teller trick. You know, it's a pen and teller trick because it has to be performed by them. Same thing with Derek Delgadio. Like he has his own voice. These are things that I do think are not present in a lot of magic. And yeah, I think that the analogy certainly works for escape room creation. And also one of the analogies I give magicians is, and this was a piece of advice that I had gotten at Magic Camp, actually, uh, by Mike Bent, who is a a comedy professor at Emerson. I think I actually butchered his quote. Like my memory of the quote was different when I emailed him when I was writing the book. Like what was the exact wording of the quote? It was slightly different. So (laughs) the version that I heard was the version I needed to hear in a weird way. (laughs) But essentially, you can try to write a comedy act or a magic act that everybody likes and nobody hates. So I call that the vanilla pudding act. Mm -hmm. Like they serve it at hospitals. Nobody's against vanilla pudding, but nobody's day is made because they had vanilla pudding. Or you could be sushi where the people who love sushi love sushi, but there are people who just will not have sushi. They hate it. It's something they avoid at any cost. That's 95% of the people love you. And in order to get that 5% of the people kind of have to hate you. It's a little bit more polarizing. That's how I approach my comedy and magic. Any point of view that you're going to take is an opinion. People will disagree with your opinion. Obviously, if the ratio is more 50-50, that's a commercial, not good idea. (laughs) 95%, 5% is probably where you want to be. (laughs) You know that you're living that when Roseanne Barr tells you that you're brave after a comedy routine. That's right. Yeah, when you're doing religion (laughs) jokes on uh, NBC, it's a a risk. I'm still bearing the uh, the results of that. (laughs) I bet you are. But I think escape rooms can do that. I think you can be a sushi room. Don't be liked by 100% of the people. Be loved by 95% of the people. I agree with that very much. And I do worry, especially it's a thing that the Turpico Awards make me worry about owners at the high end shooting for what they know is going to do well, what they know is going to be popular amongst enthusiasts instead of going and taking some risks. I worry about people softening because they want to make sure that they get a little bit higher in those rankings. We're taking a moment to thank our sponsor, Morty. Morty is a free app for discovering, planning, tracking, and reviewing your escape rooms and other immersive social outings. And Morty is now available for all to use on its brand new web experience, in addition to its fantastic iPhone app. I believe in Morty so much that I have a stake in it as an advisor. David, you know that there are few things in life I love more than escape rooms. And that is playing escape rooms when they are discounted or I can book with a promo code. Who doesn't want to save a few bucks? I know this is an expensive hobby. I promise it's worth every dollar. But if you could squeeze a little bit more value out of it, why not? And Morty has you covered. They are now offering discount codes and promo codes in the app. 
They have the largest concentration available here in Southern California, where I am, but they are starting to spread in other areas. And if you are an escape room owner and you would like to offer a discount promo code, maybe get a few more players in through the door, contact Morty. They'll hook you up. You can learn more at MortyApp.com slash Repod. That's R-E-P-O-D to sign up and get a special badge for our listeners. Link and details are in the show notes. Speaking of having to uh, deal with things, what was it like having Chris Angel threaten to sue you? (laughs) Wait, how is this related to escape rooms? <laughs> it's not. I'm changing subject. You talked changing about changing subjects. Enough. This is good. Talking about being sushi, I do a magic roast almost every year. It started out at in-person magic conventions, and then during the pandemic, it went more virtual. And so every year, I would be roasting whatever happened in magic, you know. And there, there were the usual suspects: your David Blaine's and whatever. Those kind of guys tend to make it into the roast. Chris Angel was in the roast a lot. And one year for the roast, I thought basically Chris Angel opened up a restaurant called Chris Angel's Kablip. And the Kablip stands for Chris Angel's Breakfast, Lunch and Pizza. So the full name of the restaurant is Chris Angel's Chris Angel's Breakfast, Lunch and Pizza. It's in the middle of the desert. Like it's from I'm in Las Vegas. It would still be another hour drive just into the middle of nowhere in the desert to get to this place. So I found it kind of silly. What's silly about that? Right. I mean, who doesn't love breakfast, lunch and pizza? (laughs) Other than not six-year-olds. But I I found the menu was silly. So for the end of my roast, I was like kablip.com, eatblip.com. Those are the real websites. Uh, Not kabliprestaurant.com. And I know that because I have purchased kabliprestaurant.com and I've uploaded a parody of the menu. I also, by the way, at the bottom of that page, I I still encourage people if they do enjoy the menu, which is up at kabliprestaurant.com to donate to the Johnny Christopher Charitable Foundation, which Chris set up uh, in honor of his child. Um, It does really good work for kids with cancer. So absolutely uh, donate to that. That was always one of the goals of setting it up was directing attention and money to that. But yeah, I uploaded this parody. Four days later, I got a cease and desist from Chris's lawyers. And uh, I put that online. And actually, David was the secret hero of this whole thing. Yeah, I might have forwarded your situation on to someone who knew some lawyers who offered to help you. I was in a pickle because I was paying a lawyer to help me with this. And at a certain point, you go, how much money is it worth to keep this (laughs) dumb parody website up? Uh, A lot, actually. No, but thanks to David, uh, it got to the right people. And all of a sudden, I had a pro bono lawyer from Public Citizen, Paul Allen Levy, who is a badass and does a lot of First Amendment cases, particularly with comedy and parody and the internet. This is his jam. He wrote one of the best responses to a cease and desist I've ever seen. He's like, can I put jokes in it? And I was like, hell yeah. It's so funny. We'll link to that in the show notes. I'm glad somebody donated their time to help you persist in your pettiness. That's awesome. (laughs) (laughs) You know what? It started, it really became a thing where I was hanging out at the Comedy Cell in New York, joking about this whole situation. And it really, it is a scary thing that somebody with a lot of money and power could potentially try to silence a comedian just because, right? Because even if you win a lawsuit, it's still very expensive and time consuming. And so you kind of have to make that judgment. And so it did become at a certain point, a little bit of like, yeah, a comedian should have the right to make fun of somebody, especially if that's that public and that silly. Uh, I was really glad Paul Allen stepped in. Definitely donate to Public Citizen as well, guys. It's a great organization. I'm going to move to another uh, topic. Tell me about the sold out Madison Square Garden show. Well, it very much happened and is real. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Basically, during the pandemic. I had a a comedy album deal to record a comedy album. And uh, it was very difficult to do that during the pandemic. (laughs) And I was so excited to do it. I was like, I don't want to do this material for no one or like on a Zoom call or something. So I called up the company I had to deal with. And I said, I have this other idea that I can do during the pandemic. What if we release just the audio of a very visual and extravagant illusion show that definitely happened at Madison Square Garden? (laughs) And It took a really long time. I worked with this guy, Steven Sikulski, who's an awesome buddy who's actually out in Las Vegas. He's one of the people behind Magic Live, which is like one of the biggest magic conventions in the world. And we recorded this thing in my apartment. Uh, And by that, I mean Madison Square Garden. And uh, he edited it. And by that, I mean just took the very much real recording that happened at Madison Square Garden. (laughs) Uh, And we had this 45 minute album that you could listen to on Spotify. It actually, I will spoil one thing, which is that 
Gilbert Gottfried is a celebrity guest on the album for real. We lost him in 2022. He's one of my favorite comedians. He's one of my favorite people. And he actually did record a piece that is in the album. It's such a cool Easter egg that I encourage people to find it. Wow. Talk about fake it till you make it. (laughs) I guess technically you've made it. So everyone out there, people who have made it are still faking it. So don't feel bad about it. I don't know what you mean about faking it. I definitely did it. And that's that recording is an unimpeachable proof that it definitely happened. (laughs) Duly noted. So can you tell us about another very real thing that has actually happened, which is your Cirque du Soleil show, Mad Apple in Las Vegas? Well, it's a New York themed show and they needed a Jew. Um, (laughs) (laughs) That was very important to the authenticity, um, was a sprinkling of Judaism. No, it's such a weird thing because I came to the process so fast. You know, I literally flew in 7 a.m. They spent most of the training rehearsal time because I I came up on an elevator. So they have to give you the safety spiel of like, if you put your arm here, no more arm. If you put your finger there, no more finger. Oh, you mean an elevator in the middle of the stage? Yes, it's a lift. I just kind of appear from beneath the stage and then I kind of rise up. Uh, It's very dramatic and very fun, but there's a lot of ways for it to kill you. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> there's only two companies that make those lifts. There's Otis and Schindler. And I was like, really? That's going to be my obituary is Jew killed by Schindler's lift. That's what's going to happen. That's how I'm going to go. Uh, so that, I had my lift training. And the cool thing about Cirque is they're really good about supporting you creatively as an artist. The idea is it should feel like New York. And they were like, at a New York comedy club, when you walk in, you're getting an uncensored comedy show. And we want that feeling that when you're on stage, you want them to feel like they got to go to the best New York comedy club in town. That that feeling. I was very shocked. I mean, this was so different than any other Cirque show. And I've seen a lot of them. I think usually they don't have any talking in the shows. They talk in circus in some of the shows where they, it's like a made up nonsense <laughs> language. It's like Sims talk. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's smart. The first time I think I saw a Cirque show, I was like, is this just French and I don't understand? Uh, and then I realized, oh, even the French don't understand. It's an interesting <laughs> tactic. They're like, we want everybody to be equally confused. And so now it, it appeals to an international audience. But it is cool. Like the people that speak it have figured out a way to really, it sounds like a language and you almost understand what they're saying, which is cool. And this show, it was really cool because it's a collaboration between Cirque and The Works. That's how I got involved because I had been doing The Illusionist and touring with that. That's how they knew of me. Cirque and The Works? What's that? Oh, so Cirque du Soleil acquired a company called The Works. The Works is the company behind The Illusionist, Circus 1903, a show called The Unbelievables. I was in Illusionist and Unbelievables. So those are all magic shows. Magic shows, Unbelievables had a more of a variety element. I actually got to tour Jay Johnson, which was amazing. He's one of the best ventriloquists. So nice. Uh, Shin Lim was on that tour. Uh, it was really fun. There are five Cirque du Soleil shows. This is number six. So I think there was a, a feeling too of making sure it's distinguishable from the others and having it be for 16 and over an adults only Cirque show. The stand-up comedy element was huge. In 38 years of Cirque existing, they've never had a stand-up comedian before in one of their shows. They've had lots of clowns, but never a word clown. (laughs) I describe you to friends when I'm trying to persuade them to go and see Mad Apple as viciously funny. Your comedy (laughs) has like a just a razor sharp edge to it, which I personally love. And when we went and saw you perform in Mad Apple, you were about as unrestrained as I've ever seen you. You were on fire. And it left me wondering, has Cirque put any constraints on you? Every day I go into work, I go, this is the day that they do that. (laughs) I I live in constant fear. No, so far they've been really, really, really great about saying, no, no, we understand that you need to be, don't like say something insane. We are a billion dollar company with assets to protect. I mean, they're letting you be you. Yeah, they, exactly. A hundred percent. They want me to be the most me that I can be. That was the thing that really surprised me when we saw Matt Apple was I was expecting to see Harrison a little bit held back because everyone goes to Vegas. But there was the Harrison that I know and that I've seen many times in New York, and I very much loved that. Sushi, baby. (laughs) Well, no, that was the interesting thing, too, was coming from New York to Las Vegas, stuff that was like political or opinion based. I always felt like if I only felt okay doing those jokes in New York, then I'm doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. Like I always thought if you're going to do a joke that is about somebody, you better be able to do it in front of them. 
And I want to write jokes that are sort of have an unimpeachable logic to them that even if you disagree with the opinion underneath it, you can agree with the joke or laugh at the joke. In New York, it can be a very liberal audience. Las Vegas, it's definitely more 50-50. And so it keeps me a little bit more honest in terms of really making sure the jokes have that wide appeal. And can you get somebody who disagrees just to laugh with you? So I noticed that a lot of your comedy is also improv and crowd work. So do you write jokes to prepare for that too? Or is that all just fly by the seat of your pants? Uh, I'm going to use a very old analogy. There is a Rolodex. Does, I didn't even know what that is anymore. There is a mental Rolodex of stuff. And there's also lots of backups if there is nothing in the Rolodex. But very often, it really is the first time I'm encountering something. In improv, they call it finding the game. And so I'm constantly sort of playing these mental games. Uh, and there's usually like two or three of them running simultaneously. So essentially, every comedy show is an escape room in my brain uh, <laughs> where I'm trying to solve for certain things. My favorite thing that you were doing on stage at Mad Apple was just when you lit up some of the families that had clearly brought their younger children <laughs> to the 18 plus show. I was dying. Yeah, it is weird. We do warn people pretty strongly that it is 16 and over. It says it on the tickets, on the website, on the sign, probably to be safe 18 and over, but we allow you 16 and over. And people still bring their five-year-old kid. It's not really the show for that. I think they will enjoy the show, but they will learn a lot of language and vocabulary uh, that they probably (laughs) would not have. Things I I don't think you want them to share with the classroom. (laughs) Rizova is your all-in-one, all-inclusive software for bookings made specifically with escape rooms in mind. Incorporating community-driven features, it's designed to follow the guest journey. From selecting times to book, waiver management, integrated point-of-sale system, and follow-up emails. Rizova is the ultimate online reservation software designed to elevate the guest experience, increase game master efficiency, drive sales, and improve operations. PG, what is fantastic about Rizova is that they offer something for the owners, something for the guests, and something for the GMs. What does Rizova offer the guests? As an escape room enthusiast, as a guest, what I care about in my guest experience is increased convenience. And Rosova can do that for you. First of all, they have full integration with Morty. That means that escape rooms can offer their booking times on Morty, and that's how I tend to use it the most. I want as few clicks as possible to get from me finding your escape room to me playing your escape room. And less clicks means it's easier to book. That means more revenue for you. I also like that it automates emails, reminding me of my bookings. It sends follow-up emails asking how it did, if I want to leave a review. It's just really useful and convenient for me as a guest. And that's what you want if you want guests to come back and play all of your other rooms. To learn more, get a free demo, and find out how easy Rizova can make your transition to their technology, head over to rizova.com slash rea. And be sure to use our link or drop our name, because as a thank you to Repod listeners, Rizova is offering up to $100 in Google AdWords when you sign up through our link. Details in the show notes. I don't want you to take this the wrong way. (laughs) You look very different from the rest of the cast of Mad Apple. What is it like? Are you saying I'm a fatty? Are you calling me a fat Jew comedian (laughs) surrounded by perfect athletic specimens? Is that what you're saying right now? I'm just saying you look like a different species than the other people who are on your... Is this your Kanye West moment? No, you're not in, you know, clown makeup and a costume. That's what he meant, Harrison. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) No, I have never felt fatter in my entire life. It is a constant struggle backstage because I... I like to have snacks and they look at me like vampires, garlic, uh, <laughs> carbs. What are these carbs that you have in your dressing room <laughs> that you eat? You put the carbs in your body. This is unbelievable. I once went into the gym to lift some of the weights and they all looked at me with, I think one of them literally said, those weights are for children. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Give me a break. I'm the comedian. I'm allowed to have a 15 pound weight in each hand. Be happy that I'm exercising. <laughs> 
I will be tired at a show and be like, man, I'm exhausted. And they're like, I swing from the air. (laughs) My hands. I do this for twice a day. Plus the training. (laughs) An elevator lifts you to the stage. You do dick jokes. The elevator lifts you back down. How are you tired? (laughs) So one of the things I noticed about Cirque, and I actually did go to see your show twice, and that was the cool thing about it involving comedy was I feel like it's a very repeatable experience without feeling like I'm seeing the exact same thing over and over again. But I noticed they do some things that were kind of cool, like they had this really fun intro where it felt like a speakeasy in the beginning. So there was a bar on the stage and before the show starts you can go up onto the stage and sit down at the bar on stage and order drinks and all around the front of the stage on the floor which i thought was really cool and it seems like they're dipping their toe into the immersive world into immersive entertainment a little bit do you think that's the case and do you feel like there's more room for that yeah i mean i obviously i love that stuff and doing Scam New York was not just a dipping the toe in, but like a full jump in the pool of like immersive entertainment and what it takes. And so when I saw some of the elements come together for Matt Apple, I was definitely very excited about it. And for the people that haven't been to the show yet, here's a secret. There is a secret room called the Forbidden Apple. It's next to the gift shop. And there's a secret magic show that happens for a very small crowd, usually once or twice before the show starts. So there's a secret pre-show that if you know where to find it is yours to access. For those people who kind of stumbled upon a secret room in the theater and got to see a magic show before the show even started, I think that's a really cool story you tell your friends for a long time. How early do you have to show up beforehand to try to catch it? We recommend you show up a half hour early anyway. The earlier you show up, the better, because there are the immersive elements of going on the bar and there's games that you can sort of play. And there is show before the show, and it's really cool. There's no reason not to see it. Generally, if it's like a seven o'clock show, by 6.30, you can kind of wander around. Once you know what you're looking for, you go look at the gift shop. It's right by there. There's some chairs lined up. You can get the information that you need. I think before the 7 o'clock show, I think they, they do it twice. And then before the 9.30, they might only do it once. It really depends on all sorts of things in terms of like the turnover of the room and all that kind of stuff. There's about 16 chairs, I think. So it's about the first 16 people that find out about it. Awesome. That is really cool to know. You've mentioned scam a few times already. Can you tell us a little bit about what that is? So Scam New York is a society of conjurers and magicians. It's the oldest and most secretive society in the world. Um, (laughs) Also very real, as real as Madison Square Garden. And and has an incredible logo that your fiance, Emily, has made. which I strongly recommend everyone go and really take a moment to soak the logo in. Yes, magicscam.com. The logo is right on the homepage. It came from the idea that a lot of magic organizations, the magicians just have their heads up each other's asses. And so we did that literally, like a human centipede of magic. Oh my God. (laughs) And we put that logo on everything. I have it on a hoodie. We had these big black robes. It was printed on the back. We got these projectors to project that logo everywhere in our venue. That logo is everywhere. Do, oh, do you have merch? I will buy a oh, hoodie. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Magiscam.com. <laughs> There's a Latin phrase in the logo that literally means this means nothing. <laughs> What, what is that phrase? I don't remember it because I just put this means nothing into Google Translate <laughs> <laughs> and then crossed my fingers and hoped it was accurate. Uh, it is hoc non significat a liquid. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So tell us a little bit about how this show worked. So it's funny because when we originally could, it went through so many iterations because of the pandemic. So the original idea, Patrick had come to me and I said, wouldn't it be funny if we give away the scam awards, there is an award in magic that essentially you can buy. And so it's sort of a running joke in the magic community about this one award that anybody who says, oh, I won this award. You're like, I mean, you paid a guy and he picked a title and now you're an award winning magician. We pretty much have that in escape rooms, too. I'm not going to name names. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Best escape room in this tiny area featuring a zombie and also a Sudoku puzzle. <laughs> Wow. I can't believe it. How did they win? There were so many in that category. (laughs) All right. So it's like buying Twitter blue. (laughs) 
<laughs> right, exactly. So the idea had been, we're going to do this show where after every performer performs, we were going to give them a scam award. And so the poster would essentially be every magician is an award winner. And the reason it, they were award winners because we were giving them the award at the end of each act. That was the germ of the idea. We were going to launch that. It was just going to be basically a regular show. Then the pandemic happened. It scuttled our whole launch. I think it was kind of a blessing in disguise because then we did a virtual show called Scam Online that by episode 16 became like a really low budget Doctor Who, like sci-fi extravaganza. There was an episode where every performer was named Eric. (laughs) There was a episode where we went around the world, but every performer was from Canada. There was an episode where we traveled through time. So we had a silent act with the silent movie cards and a 70s act. It was really fun. And I think we had an act from the future. So we built up all this lore for this organization. There's an arch rival organization. And we had gone to this venue that had these rooms and weird knickknacks. Scam ended up going to two different venues. But we realized these karaoke venues have multiple rooms. They're often really decorated in a cool way. And we were the first post-pandemic magic show. We were the first magic show after New York said, you can have a show. And we were like, how do we do this safely other than make sure everybody's vaccinated? But we decided we would split if there's 100 people showing up. And we kept those numbers way lower than that at the beginning. But even if there was 30 people showing up, what is we divided those 30 people into six rooms of five? And so basically you were only with your group and the magicians would rotate. They'd wear masks and be vaccinated and be far away. You would never have to be in an audience larger than your own group. And a karaoke venue really lends itself to that. And then on top of it, I really wanted to take all this lore we had built with Scam and make it feel like you were going to this meeting. And that was the story. Everything came out of that story. And of course, if you were going to come into, like, why were you coming to our secret meeting if not to try to be initiated into our society? And what better way to be initiated than to prove your worth through solving puzzles? And that's where the escape room part comes in. So one of the magicians that rotated into your room was essentially a set of puzzles. So you would see three or four magicians and you'd have this puzzle experience and it was all tied together by the overarching narrative of the scam. And it became this really fun project. The hardest part about it was we were doing it in these karaoke venues where we had to set up a full immersive environment and tear it down every Sunday. Uh, That was exhausting. (laughs) But honestly, using a karaoke joint as a pop-up venue is honestly genius. I remember when you first told me about it and I was like, it was just blowing my mind because I was like, this makes perfect sense. They've got rooms set up for up to 10 people. They've already got their AV systems Mm -hmm. in there. You know, most of these places already have licenses for booze. So, you know, you can serve drinks, beers, what have you. Like, I thought that was absolutely brilliant. And most of them have little buttons that you press that bring the waiter into your room. And the AV was great. I mean, like you can put a video of the logo on every television screen in a venue. That goes a really long way. We also realized that just making things dark helps and focusing light where you needed to. There's these Amazon LED lights that just aim really well and create a really spooky environment. And talking about idea first, we wanted all these creepy photos throughout the years of scam, black and white photos that we would Photoshop our faces into. (laughs) Uh, And by us, I mean my fiance, Emily, who's very good at graphic design. But then I realized, why couldn't those be puzzles? I wanted people to really take those photos in. Can I lead them on a journey through those photos? And so we started using RFID and NFC and all that stuff built into those photos. But they started with the idea first of this is a way to get you into the world. And then the puzzles are just kind of gravy that really add extra narrative backbone to those things that were already there. I was glad that the lighting was low because the second time I went to Scam, I witnessed one of the most ridiculously awkward human interactions with one of the people who was randomly in my room as we had a very, it was just three of us. I'm going to save this for the bonus episode. Um, (laughs) It was so appallingly and hilariously uncomfortable. Uh, I was glad that I didn't have to look him in the eye that much. (laughs) (laughs) I don't remember the details for this, so I'm excited. (laughs) Nobody touched you in a no-no place. Uh, No. (laughs) Okay, good. Good. (laughs) Not without my permission. All right. (laughs) Was he touching himself, though? (laughs) No, it was a different kind of awkward. (laughs) So scam may be coming back. Yes. There's all these things where if we had a static venue, a permanent venue, I think we could Mm -hmm. take everything that much farther because they can be installed and really rigged. But I 
okay i have one more question about that though it sounds like you had multiple magicians working and not room for a very large audience so how do you make something like that financially viable when you have so many performers entertaining for a very small crowd magicians mostly work for attention (laughs) <laughs> no, you know what? Com- that's comedians. Comedians will work for jalapeno poppers, but uh, as I have, but just to tend to be a little bit better with that. And we always wanted to pay really competitively. We wanted to make sure we, they were being well compensated, but it worked out math wise. We sort of worked out the algebra of how many magicians you need for how many rooms. And because of the escape room, which counted as a slot, we usually had two or three magicians and Patrick and I were two of those magicians. Patrick Davis was my partner in this. So we already had two locked away and we weren't really paying ourselves. We were putting it all back in the business. So we were two ahead, plus we had the escape room. So we were really three ahead. And then we'd have one or two special guests or more and it scales up. So if you add enough rooms and enough ticket sales, it always made sense to add a magician to add a room. That always worked out. So you're counting the escape room as its own slot. So let me get this. So the audience is sitting in a room and then a magician would come in and perform an act and then they would rotate out and then another magician would come in. In between the acts, the performers would leave behind something for you to solve. I see. Everybody's experience was slightly different. It was like the Millennium Falcon in Disney where there are more than one cockpits, but you (laughs) think you're going into the Millennium Falcon. Once COVID allowed us to have bigger groups, there's sort of an on-ramp. So everybody comes in, they get the agenda, which also acts as sort of a playbill and also had a bunch of secret puzzles in it. So if you came early, there's all sorts of puzzles in the lobby that were sort of hidden around. Some in the agenda, some were in these books. The meeting starts, there's a big trick together that sets the scene for this adventure where you're, oh my God, this is, you're on a very special night that just happens every single time, but it's very special. (laughs) This one time that this happened every time. Uh, Then we quickly get everybody into their own rooms where you're going to have a sort of unique experience because each room will have either a magician or the escape room puzzles. That was never the first thing that happened. But essentially your experience in that room was you would see a magician that would introduce the escape room puzzles. And now you have something to be working on anytime there was sort of a gap. The next magician comes in, the next magician comes in. Uh, We're also sort of watching you and trying to give you enough time between the magicians and during that dedicated puzzle time to try to get you as close to the end as possible. Then there was a big sort of finale, which happened in the room. Towards the end of the run, we got everybody out of the room and did it all as one group. So there was a book ending. Uh, We wanted there to be sort of a big illusion at the beginning and a big illusion at the end. And that was where if you solved the puzzle, you knew the password and that password allowed you to be initiated. And we ran through different variations where everybody in the rooms would be able to provide the password so you can win or lose. Then we realized it was more important narratively to just get you through the experience. The people who did the worst of the escape room did the best of their ability. They were usually the least experienced players. It didn't make sense to penalize them and make them feel bad. So we would bring them all into the room. And if anybody got the solution, the whole group had won. And that felt a little bit better. And there were so many other puzzles like around the hallway. There's so many bonus puzzles that an experienced person could get that they could win, but get those extra credit that it felt like the real experienced people got extra credit. They did better, quote unquote, than the least experienced people. But everybody got to have a good ending that brought the narrative together. That sounds like so much fun. Can you bring this to Las Vegas, please? So it's at least a little bit closer to me. (laughs) I would love that. That would be amazing. (laughs) Wink, wink. (laughs) (laughs) So speaking of other things that you've created, you proposed to your fiance, Emily, with an elaborate escape the neighborhood. Yes. (laughs) Can you give us the short version of how this adorable proposal worked? Well, I, it started off with me screwing myself, which was my best friend, Andrew, wanted to propose to his now wife, Tracy. And we had done a lot of escape rooms together. Our escape room team was basically Andrew Tracy, me, Patrick, and Eric. So when Andrew wanted to propose, I was like, you should do it in an escape room. No one's ever done that before. And at the time, it was pretty unique. (laughs) So we set it up so that the last puzzle of an escape room would lead into the proposal as opposed to the escape, which was kind of funny because that meant Andrew and I had to do the escape room first. So we knew all the puzzles. So we were trying to actually... We knew all the answers and we're trying to direct the team so they would end at the right time because all their family was gathered outside the escape room and we wanted her to get out and then have everybody be there. 
So she couldn't escape too fast. So there were times where we were trying to throw them off like they were doing too well. And we're like, what about that thing? Maybe that's a puzzle. And it <laughs> definitely wasn't. So there was all that. So I, I, I helped plan this elaborate escape room proposal. When it came time to my proposal, Emily knew I had done that. And I was like, oh, no, I can't just do that again. I have to scale this thing up. Plus, it was the pandemic. Nothing but time. Exactly. I had the time to do this. Emily would go to bed and then at like two o'clock in the morning, I would stay up till five o'clock in the morning, just like building this website, planning all this stuff. And then, you know, tell her I was working on podcasting stuff, but I was working on this elaborate ruse. The basic game of it was we went to Mimi's, the place we had our first date, so a uh, place that was very special to us. I said, hey, I have to go to the bathroom, <laughs> which is how I had my first kiss with her. I said, I have to go to the bathroom. And then I leaned in and kissed her on the way to the bathroom. So it was part of... <laughs> A weird part of our story. I went to the bathroom. I never came back. I did pay the bill, though. She, that would have been funny, though, if I just left her with the bill. <laughs> I'm out of here. The waiter brought over a card with a QR code. She scanned it. There was a video of me explaining it. Essentially, somebody in our family, friends, her sister, my sister, whoever it was, her grandparents, would give her a clue that would get her to a location in her neighborhood. She would search the front of that location for a QR code. Because during the pandemic, especially, if you just taped a QR code to a window, it wasn't going anywhere. <laughs> and I taped two or three just to make sure if one got pulled down, there'd be something. But there's all these QR codes taped on these different locations throughout the neighborhood. She would scan it. That would bring up the next clue that would take her to the next location. So it was this sort of scavenger hunt escape room thing. Uh, her final puzzle was looking on the map to put every position that she had been, realizing she had drawn a heart. You marched her around the city in the shape of a heart in the freezing cold. Yes. Yeah, so that was the part that was less <laughs> planned was that it was January. It felt like the right time to do it, but it was not just cold January. It was like unbelievably cold, but it had all been planned. And I was like, we have to do it. <laughs> like it's ready to go. Everybody's ready to go. I hired my friend Ruben, who was my director of photography, uh, a main camera guy for this travel series I did. I've known him since Magic Camp. He filmed the whole thing because I was like, this is a pandemic proposal. So if we don't have a video, people won't be able to really participate. So there's a video online. If you go to my YouTube channel, you can watch it in all its glory. It's a beautiful video. Ruben did an incredible job. You watch the whole thing happen. Did he just like stalk her around the city like a wildlife photographer? Like, did she know that she was being followed with a <laughs> yes, with yes, camera? Yes, to mic her up. So <laughs> you see that in the beginning of the video is that Ruben was hiding the whole time. And then as soon as she gets the card, he kind of pops out to film it. And you see her go like, Ruben? <laughs> we, we, he has like very distinct red hair. And we thought like, we could hide it with a hat. And maybe if he wore glasses, Emily wouldn't realize it. The second he walked over, she was like, Ruben. And she knew that point. And this is a proposal. Like She just burst into tears. It's very cute. She just didn't know that she was going to really have to work for it in the freezing cold. <laughs> That's really awesome. Yeah. That is super adorable. Well, I'll put the link to the video in the show notes. Yes, absolutely. There'll be lots of links in the show notes because Harrison has recorded everything <laughs> and I've watched <laughs> All of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's time you'll never get back. <laughs> um, do you have any tips for any of our listeners who are thinking about creating their own scavenger hunt escape room proposal? Definitely test it. That's really important because you only get one shot at it. I did have my sister run around because that was the other problem was it was hard during a pandemic to really come up with good excuses for why I needed to leave the house. <laughs> Uh, so I had my sister sneak out once and just make sure every QR code did what it needed to do. And there was like hints built in. There's like a secret website. It's one of those things where you got, it's got to work and really come up with a robust hint system so that if something does break, things don't go too far off track. Awesome. Good to know. So I see here that you have also competed on America's Got Talent and Last Comic Standing. I have been eliminated from all of your favorite reality television shows. <laughs> well, so have I, so it's all right. Uh, <laughs> I know that when you get on stage, you feel like you and your material is being judged, but this feels like a super intense form of judgment. I mean, and speaking as somebody that's been on a reality show running around in my underwear, it's pretty tough, but I do feel like that's different than being on a competition show where your craft is what's really being judged. How do you deal with that? And what is performing on a reality show like? Yeah, that is the part that is really scary is that you're going on that show to say, this is what I've dedicated my whole life to. This is my livelihood. 
I'm going to get five minutes to show you what I've accomplished. And if you don't like it, my whole life is over. (laughs) I mean, not over, but you're like, this is important to me what I'm doing. Like if you lose big brother, you can still go back to your law firm and they're not going to be like, well, I guess you're bad at law. (laughs) It's almost the opposite where like the type of reality show that I was on, it's like you are a character, but you're still kind of yourself. And it's more Mm. like we're judging you as a person and your whole personality and your like life philosophy versus maybe on those competition shows, you can compartmentalize a little bit. Well, they're not judging me as a person. They're just judging my work. Well, with stand-up, it feels like the same thing. <laughs> True. <laughs> I think that's, that's so tough about stand-up or like doing original magic is like, they're rejecting you. <laughs> if you're an actor in a bad play, they still might think you're a great actor. Like I've seen plenty of musicals where I'm like, she was great, but the show is bad. Uh, that doesn't happen with stand-up comedy or magic. Nobody goes, he's hilarious. Just the show, like you are the show. They're judging you as you're a complete package. Um, there's no escape. The weird thing about America's Got Talent and Last Comic versus like doing Conan or like I did Sherry recently is that with a reality television show, it kind of doesn't matter if you do good or bad, because if you do bad, it's still great television. It's just bad for you as a person. It's bad for you, but not bad for the show. When you're invited to a place like Conan or Sherry, they're booking you because they want you to succeed and they succeed when you succeed. So all of a sudden, everything is about making sure you have the best experience possible and really helping you. America's Got Talent Last Comic, you're a little bit more on your own because it's a competition. And if you do poorly, it's also good television. It it just feels like it's coming from a very different place. You definitely have to self-advocate a lot more. Uh, America's Got Talent, that first set, which, I mean, they did a great job. The edit looks great. And like, you know, I come across really, really well. I think they made me show up on set at like 7 a.m. or 8 a.m. And then I didn't film my stand-up bit until about 11 p.m. Oh my God, yeah. Hurry up and wait. Yeah. You know, I was exhausted. I was hungry. I'm talking to somebody who was on Survivor. I'm sure you were exhausted and hungry the entire (laughs) time. But they make you do that set. It's not under the most ideal circumstances. It's terrible. And did you know when you were going on or do you just constantly have to be on the edge of readiness? Constantly on the edge of readiness where you're like, ah, is this my, no, oh, oh, okay. (laughs) That Um, sounds awful. That's like when I auditioned for Survivor, I must have downed 10 pots of coffee because I wanted to be like on, but you don't know when they're going to call you. So you're just in your room, just hyping yourself up and it could be all day. Maybe you're the last person going on. It, It sounds so hard. Do they vet your performance before you go on? Do you have to like work with someone there to get approval first? Oh, yeah. Any of these TV shows, when you're doing any kind of performance, they're running you through standards and practices. There's all sorts of layers. The funniest story was I was doing a different TV show and they came back and they said, we only need you to strike two sentences. And I looked at the script that I had sent them and they had struck in two of the (laughs) punchlines. I was about to say, standards and practices must love you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I was like, you want me to do the joke and then not the punchline? I'm just going to submit new jokes. <laughs> uh, one of the weirdest ones was last comic. I had a joke where I talk about people always quote from the Bible in English, but the Bible wasn't written in English, which means you're basically, if you're living your life by the English translation of the Bible, you're basically living your life by a game of telephone that never gets the message exactly <laughs> as you intended. Uh, like I could never telephone a message correctly to the back of this room. Like if I leaned in, I was just like, Hey, the dog is brown. You might turn to the other guy and be like, Hey, the dog is down. Then you might turn to the other guy and be like, Hey, the log <laughs> is down. Then you might turn to the other guy and be like, stone all the gays. <laughs> And I think it was last comic. It could be another TV show. It was a major show. And they said, you can't say stone all the gays, but you can say murder all the gays. <laughs> and I was like, that's worse. <laughs> that's way worse. Exactly. People don't even really stone people anymore. So at least this is an archaic form of murder. <laughs> Any story I've ever heard about interactions with standards and practices has left me bewildered. Like, I I genuinely wonder, like, who are these people? And like, when they were growing up, were they like, oh, this is what I want to do. I just want to torture the English language and murder people's belief in humanity. It's where hall monitors (laughs) go to prosper. I mean, (laughs) yes, they're verbal hall monitors. It's an impossible job. They're protecting million dollar businesses. You sometimes, though, yeah, you get these notes and you're like, this is silly. 
Okay, so going to start to bring this in for a close. Lisa and I have recently been watching the entire run of the British show Taskmaster, which makes comedians compete with one another in ridiculous tasks for silly prizes. Lisa and I have concluded that you, Harrison, need to compete on this show. Who do we lobby to make this happen? Oh my God, this is my literal dream. Taskmaster is one of my favorite shows. We did a scam episode that was essentially Magic Taskmaster. It was maybe my favorite episode. I love that show to death. I would move to London just to be on that show. (laughs) The guy who created it is the sidekick. He's actually the... uh... Yeah, Alex Horn is actually the creator of it. So if you want to tweet at Alex Horn and say Harrison Greenbaum is uh, a Las Vegas headliner, he's so funny, and this is his dream, he was born to do this... Maybe it can't hurt. Maybe Greg Davies, but I think Alex is probably the guy to go for. But I would love nothing more than to be on that show. I watch every episode. I strategize when I watch the episode. I'll like pause it and be like, what would I do? Oh, man, I love it. (laughs) All right, Steve, when you edit this, can you like clip this thing out? Just this little portion of this conversation so that we can put it into a tweet and we'll get everyone to retweet it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Come on. We're going to start a thing. When this episode goes out, we're going to tweet this. We're asking everybody to go on to the dystopia that is Twitter and hit retweet. (laughs) Yes, do it. Do it. That would be the greatest. All right. (laughs) So, Harrison, what are a couple of your current favorite top escape rooms? Ooh, this is a very good question. I feel like I think about like particular moments that I'm like, this moment. I wish I could bottle up and just like uncap and breathe it back in. Old City Escape Rooms in Philly has a room called the Midnighters, which the story is you're supposed to feel like you're in a Goonies-esque type thing. You know, a band of misfit children dealing with a sort of supernatural mystery to solve. And the soundtrack like moves along with the puzzles. Like as you solve the puzzles, it ramps and it really, you feel like you're living in 80s fantasy. And it was exceptional. So that room is worth checking out for sure. Texas had a couple of standouts. Going to the chapel at Grapevine Escape was really unique and interesting. I thought that was fascinating just because I feel like you get to a certain point, 200 escape rooms in where you're very jaded. So anybody who's taking a big swing is just, you're like, thank God somebody's doing something weird and unusual. Mr. Wong's is right in that area too. Yeah, this is all in the Dallas area. Yeah, and that's crazy because it is a Chinese restaurant their family owned that they basically turned into an escape room. That's pretty cool. There was a puzzle in Council Bluffs, Iowa at a place called Cryptic Room. The room is called Paradise, question mark. There was one puzzle that really just tickled me. It's really clever. And I just, it's that idea of customizing stuff to the specific players every time. That's a magical moment. Susie Essman, who's on Curb Your Enthusiasm, she always had a piece of advice, which was when you're doing a live comedy show, if you just do the same show every time, then you're not really giving them a reason to see you live. They might as well just watch you on YouTube or watch your special because it's the exact same thing. So with Matt Apple, every show is different. Every single show. You can see it more than once because every show, I am really reacting to the crowd in real time. Escape rooms can do that where you are getting a unique experience where they're really customizing it to you and you feel like there's a reason I went there today. Cryptic Room had that. I would love to see that in more rooms. I made a little list just to be prepared. We, we got enough. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, good. Those are all very good rooms. Fantastic. Oh, awesome. I love that you mentioned a bunch of rooms that I'd never really heard of, too. That's what I was trying to do. I was trying to avoid the biggies and do what really random ones. Harrison going hipster. No, they're good selections. <laughs> I was there first. <laughs> I played that first. Uh, Harrison, what comes next for you? That is a really good question. I'm with this show for a while. I do the show 10 times a week. And just, yeah, working on a bunch of projects. You are all terrible. The book is going to come out this year. Finally, it's only taken three years since writing it. And yeah, I'm going to do a bunch of escape rooms. I really hope I can bring Scam back in a new form, hopefully a more permanent form. So look out for that for sure. We called it Scam New York because we wanted it to be Scam Los Angeles, Scam Las Vegas, all that kind of stuff. And yeah, hopefully my special sometime soon. And obviously, the most importantly, appearing on the next series of Taskmaster. <laughs> you heard it here, folks. He's going to be on Taskmaster. I'm putting it out into the universe. <laughs> it's like the secret, but it'll work. <laughs> All right. Where can people find you on social media? 
Yeah, you can follow me online at Harrison Comedy is my Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. HarrisonGreenbaum.com is my website, has my tour dates. And MadAppleLV.com, that's where you can get tickets to Mad Apple, Cirque du Soleil's newest show at the New York Hotel and Casino. Go see Mad Apple. It is a riot. Thank you, Harrison, for joining us. This has been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. I really, really appreciate it. The Reality Escape Pod is produced by Lisa Spira. Music by Ryan Elder of RyanElderMusic.com. Edited by Steve Ewing of Stand Inside Media. And brought to you by RoomEscapeArtist.com. Your home for well-researched, rational, and reasonably humorous escape room and immersive gaming content and events. Our Patreon is the backbone. It is the foundation. It is the thing that allows us to put in all of the time, care, and money that we invest into creating podcasts like this and all of the daily content that Room Escape Artist creates. David and I have put a lot of work and thought into creating really awesome content for our Patreon supporters. Backing us at the $5 level gets you access to the RIA Discord. We have really fun conversations, discussions about escape rooms, immersive experiences, and more. And it also gets you access to our bonus show. This is a companion show to our main episode, and it's usually a more casual chat with our guests and each other. These episodes are pretty long. They're another 40 to 60 minutes. So if you can't get enough of our content, you can get more of it here. And we also tend to get a little bit looser here as well. If you have been enjoying this podcast, we would really appreciate a five-star rating and review wherever you listen to your podcasts. It doesn't cost you anything, but it really helps us spread the word about Reality Escape Pod. Thank you to our highest level Patreon backers. Breakout Games, Derek Tam, Olivier Escape, Escapism, Escaparium, Panic Room, Byron Delmonico, Josh Rosenfeld, Paula Swan, Rex Miller, Scott Olson, and the Ministry of Peculiarities. Thank you all so much for your ongoing support. There's a lot of moments in escape rooms, especially the horror rooms, where I just react um, not ideally. The key tactic that I've discovered for being a little bit calmer in an escape room is that if there's a spooky actor, we name him or her or them Stan. And it (laughs) takes a lot of the sting out of the room because zombies are scary, but Stan, not scary. So uh, there's been several escape rooms all over the country where you would have heard me screaming, Stan, no Stan. We don't like that Stan. Uh, And then being very confused is why I am calling them Stan. That is definitely a habit that we picked up. There was a room in Utah. It was very, they are very aggressive. I think without alcohol or caffeine or freedom, they take it out on us escape room participants. There were people who I was like, this is how they're getting off. Like they are, this is borderline abusive. Uh, There was a room where I I knew that I was going to get scared the second I put my head out of the tunnel. And I think my whole team heard me scream, no, you will not throw that at me. You you Stan, no. Not today, Stan. Not today, Stan. And then she threw a brain at me. And I was like, God damn it, Stan. (laughs) I told you not to do it. Um, But there is a, a story that I was told by a game master in Queens, New York, that I thought was great. It involves a man named Dave. He was an escape room enthusiast and he brought his friends who had never been to an escape room before to a spooky escape room. They did not have the stand clue, but towards the end of the room, the story is all about sacrificing something to this demon in order to escape. And the clue just happened to involve the letters D, A, V, and E shuffled. And the room decided that was a custom puzzle They were like, oh my God, Dave's in on it. And they tried to sacrifice Dave. (laughs) The game masters literally had to jump in because they had grabbed Dave, had slammed him against a door and started basically screaming sacrifice, thinking that would end the game. (laughs) So if you're going to have a puzzle, make sure it's not a real name because poor (laughs) Dave was almost sacrificed by his friends to a fake demon to appease the escape room gods. The story was not about me. (laughs) (laughs) Thank God. (laughs) 